Sponsored by the Big 98, Nashville's number one for new country and the home of a Bobby Bone show. Rock Interview is so pleased to bring you uh, an incredible guitar virtuoso. He's a, a songwriter, composer, Ingve Malmsteen with a brand new album. Ingve, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thank you. My pleasure. You know, I've been listening to the tracks off the new album off of Parabellum and uh, just some great sounding music. I mean, your, your chops sound better than ever. Thank you much. Uh, well, you know, if for some strange reason after all these years, I'm still inspired, you know? It's kind of a weird thing because I've been playing the guitar for many years and it's, <laughs> it never gets old for some reason. You just you pick the guitar up and it's always something new coming out. So well, you know, very, especially the, this album that you recorded with Parabellum, you know, during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, it, as this is releasing, you've already got two of the singles out and four, four of the songs include vocals also. And it seems like you really... Uh, took it to the next level. You know, you never repeat yourself, Ingbe. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's a certain style, of course, certain sound. I mean, I, the funny thing with this record is I didn't, I didn't try to go this direction or that direction or whatever. I just, I just allowed it to come to me in here in right. the studio and I recorded it. And, um, you know, having all that extra time, almost a year in the studio, meant that I could, what I call, I, what I would call it detail the songs. Ah. If you listen, well, you don't, haven't heard the whole album, but when you hear the whole album, it's a lot of inst like uh, neoclassical instrumental things that are like, mm -hmm. quite crazy, actually. So basically the, the arrangements and the, the harmonies and the little different bass lines and, you know, this backing vocals and stuff, like everything I built, you know, from having the original idea, obviously, but right. listening in the car, you know, because I, I love what I do. I take my stuff and listen. I have these Ferraris that I'm crazy about, you know. I ride around and top down, and I just listen to the stuff. And I really work it without really working on the songs that way, you know. So when I go back in the studio, I have, whoa, I have all these other notes. I say to the engineer, i got to do this, 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 this. And then next time I do the same thing, and there's got to be something else added on. So it was a great feeling to... Uh, Kill like have no limit on time at all. Normally, I go on tour in the middle of a recording. I, yeah. I go on tour, I, I do some recording, and I go on tour, and I go back. You know, that's what I normally do, which is not bad either. That's pretty good too because you come back and you have some distance. But but this time I, I allowed it to be distance at the same in a different way because I was in the studio a lot. <laughs> well, you know, and you're also known for not doing a lot of takes. Because you usually, you know, uh, one or two takes, you're like either either it's right or it's not. But also, you know, one of the things I've always admired about you, Ingve, and uh, and I'm sure you know you've kind of been a, a gateway music source for a lot of young people to the great classical composers like Paganini and Bach and all this. And I enjoy, you know, hearing your song, especially your new cuts. And I can hear the classical parts in there because I studied classical, and uh, it's just it's so great to hear those pieces within your music in this rock and guitar work? Well, I mean, what happened was many, 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 many years ago when I started, I grew up in a classical, a classically trained family. Mm -hmm. Everybody was trained, like my older siblings were violinists and pianists and stuff like that. And my mother was an opera, uh, my, my mother was a singing in a choir and jazz singer too. My father's a singer, guitar player. My uncle is an opera tenor in a Royal Opera in Stockholm. Um, on and on and on. And so when I was five, I got my first guitar. When I was six, I got a trumpet. Actually, my, four, my fourth birthday, I got a violin. Then, then fifth uh, guitar and a sixth a trumpet and two piano lessons and everything. But I didn't start to play until I saw Hendrix on TV smashing the guitar up. And I was only seven years old. Wow. And I had the guitar already. And I said, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> so I listened to blues. You know, I, my, my mom had a John Mayall Blues Breakers album. Yeah. So I listened to that. I go, wow, this is cool, you know. And I went totally away from the classical thing. And then when I realized that blues, as much as I love blues and all the other guitar players, it's five notes in the scale, five mm -hmm. notes, you know, which is, it felt a little bit like, whoa, is that it? So I listened to, so I listened to Vivaldi and Bach and Mozart. And, 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 and oh, of course I love the Marshall stacks and the smoke bombs and Stratocaster and all that stuff. And I wouldn't change that. I didn't want to start playing the violin. I have one there. Um, 
so that's how it happened. And then eventually you heard Nicola Paganini, which is, you know, the incredible arpeggios and stuff like that, you know. So, and if that was many, many, many years ago, so it's totally natural thing to me now. So when I go in the studio or I sit in front of TV or whatever, play guitar, when I just improvise, that is what comes out. Wow. You know, like the, well, all that stuff. That's yeah. natural. I don't, I don't think about it. It's just there, mm-hmm. you know? So when it comes to recording, the takes for the improvised solos, I don't do them over. But if it's a written part, I don't do it exactly right. I, yeah, yeah, let's punch in there, whatever, you know. So that, I do that. But for the improvised parts, that there's really only one inspired take, really, that's going to work. And if it right. doesn't work that day, it's going to work another day. That's amazing. Well, you know, and, and I was going to bring up for some of our viewers that don't realize it, you were discovered by Mike Varney from uh, Shrapnel as a teenager, and then he kind of lured you to L.A. to come and, and be a part of his label and play. And, you know, I mean, you look at how your career has taken off over the years, Ingve, it's and with your time with Alcatraz and obviously, you know, so many other bands that have tried to lure you in to play with them. And you've continued to pursue your, your solo career and, and still doing great music. Thank you. Well, it's, it's a really interesting little backstory to that. So, as I said, I started playing when I was seven. And when I say right. I started playing, I really started playing. I was playing like 12 hours a day. People thought I was crazy. I was just a little kid. And people were, what's this kid doing? It just didn't stop, you know? And so by the time I was eight, nine, 10 years old, I, I had a backing band, you know, like a bass player and a drummer. And I would gig around. People would go, what, what is this? But this was in the 1970s in Sweden. And it was a very different type of society. They weren't very, very open to this kind of thing. Huh. Very socialist uh, Basically, they told you, you can't do that. You're never going to make it. You got to go to school. You got to cut your hair. And it, like, it was very anti this. Wow. So I kept on doing this. I kept on recording. I kept on recording demos and, and, and gigging around town and smashing up guitars. And so I, then I saw, I read, uh, I saw in Guitar Player magazine, so like it's send a cassette tape. I said, okay. I didn't think anything is going to happen. And the funny part is this on this cassette tape that I sent to Mike Varney, I play the drums, the bass, the keyboards, guitars, and sing. I play everything. And wow. this was, I was 18 then. <laughs> so, because my, gra- my, my grandfather was a drummer, so we had a drum kit laying around. So I learned how to play drums. Uh, and my uncle built a recording studio, so I could use that. So I was kind of lucky in a lot of ways like that. But, so when I came to the States, I'll never forget it. It was very strange, you know. But we did one show, opening up for Glenn Hughes, and it was 30 people, 30 people in the audience. And I didn't care. I was happy. I was like running around doing my thing. Next weekend, we played a troubadour in LA. And from the upstairs dressing room, you can see the street. So I'm looking down. I'm like, wow, look at this. It's a huge line outside. I asked somebody working in the place, like, who's playing tonight? He points to me, you are. So one week in the United States, and the noise wow. was, it was took off. Mm-hmm. So after all these years, 18 years of working in Sweden, nothing. So I was really happy. I'm not, I'm not, going, I'm not going back. I'm staying here. <laughs> well, well, and I'll tell you, I don't blame you with the awards and everything else you've got. And I've got to bring this up that in 2009, Time Magazine listed you as one of the 11 greatest guitar players of all times. What does that feel like? Well, it, it's very flattering, of course. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, all of the awards that I have, they're, they're all, all the accolades, they're incredible. But I got to be honest with you. It doesn't, I don't pat myself on the back and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm extremely critical of myself, my work. And, and I, when I, like when I go on stage, where I do this here, I don't give myself any breaks. I never go, yeah, well, I recorded this and I got this. No, 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 no. It's the moment that counts now. Mm-hmm. So that's very nice. You know, I get bad reviews too. So they, they, they mean either one, you know what I mean? Right. But, but you've had such a, a huge following of fans and everything throughout your career. And, uh, and I know I wanted to bring this up with your uh, Fender signature model, which you've gone through several incarnations, but you've always stuck with the old Marshall amplifiers 
But, uh, you know, seeing you at the NAM shows here in Nashville and in Anaheim, it's always great to see you uh, playing your signature models. And I did you use that mainly on your uh, on your new album? Yeah, I used this. Uh, what this one of them? I have. If I could turn the camera around, I have sixty-two Marshall heads here, sixty-two, and a couple hundred guitars. I realized a long time ago this is my weapon of choice, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was extremely honored when Fender came to me in nineteen eighty-six, which is before everybody else. Nineteen eighty-six. Right. You were the one of the first signature. Dan model. Smith, God bless him. He he was such a great guy. But when he took over the Fender company, he 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 really revived it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was happy that I wasn't playing like the you know the the super strats, whatever they were called back then, you know. Right. So I was just on my Rising Force album, just a strat on the front. And they go, whoa, yeah, this kid we might do something with him. So I was extremely happy. And now actually, I just found out this is number one selling guitar they got. Wow. Sold out everywhere. Yes. I think that's also a revival of your style of music. And, you know, and once again, obviously you developed it with Fender. You know, your your model is very unique with the scallop fretboard and with the brass nut and certain things much, you know, very similar taken from your original Strat that you yeah. played for so many years. You know, the duck or the play it loud guitars is called. Yeah, it's similar to that. The funny thing is when, when they first came to, to they were well, playing a Long Beach Arena and they came backstage and they started meshing. And right then I was playing a 56 and a 61. Those yeah. were my main guitars at that day. So the model that came out first had a small head stock and it were like the 50s and 60s model. Mm -hmm. I think 2005 or six is when I, I kind of made them to make this one. Yeah. Which is really what I love, except it's got a four bolt on the back. Four bolt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. More secure. Uh, yes. And, uh, and I got Sing S Seymour Duncan made me the pickups and they're, they're incredible. I love Seymour Duncan. What a great company. Oh, totally. Well, I've got to ask you, too, obviously with the new album, uh, Parabellum, and it's got, you know, two singles out so far. I also enjoyed the artwork on here, and I understand that the uh, the art will be auctioned off for a charity, but, uh, I mean, it, it looked like a guitar hero on there. It's a really great, I love that cover, and it was my wife's idea. My wife, April, she said to me one time, we see him have coffee, he goes, you know, you should have a painting on the cover. I said, okay. She found the painter. She set the whole thing up. And, you know, it's great. So, so it's all because of her. And I, I'm extremely happy with the cover. I think it's amazing. Really good. It looks great. Well, and I've got to ask you this too, anyway, with, uh, with the album coming out and with the singles and everything, are you already planning your tour? Because I'm sure it's going to be, you know, you are so huge in Japan. You know, going all the way back to your Alcatraz years and everything else. And so I know when you get back touring, it's going to have to be a world tour. Yes, it's a world tour. Unfortunately, the rest of the world is not so, f you know, in front of this thing as we mm -hmm. are here. And especially in Florida, there's like, it's, we wide open the whole time. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, I'm actually going to Serbia next week. I'm headlining wow. a festival there. They call the Arsenal Festival. Uh, then I'm doing Florida, South Florida gigs in July and Texas, and then I do some clinics. And then November, December, we have a huge American tour all over the book, like 35 gigs. Wow. Coast to coast. Yeah. So, so, uh, and I'm hoping they can put something in between there too, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, we'll, we'll see. And then of course, you know, as I'm doing an interview with you now, I'm doing six, seven interviews every day for, for weeks now. So after <laughs> I'm doing another six interviews and, um, so I'm doing a lot of international stuff for different countries and stuff, and they all want the, you know, the shows, but I think they're a little bit behind us. Gotcha. But I'm definitely doing that, for sure. But it, but it has to be great to be able to put an album out and get such awareness. I was listening to your Spotify channel, too, and it's like, you know, you're already getting so many plays through YouTube, through Spotify and everything else, and you've only got a few tracks out. And I know the way you designed this album, and it will be available on, on a, a red transparent vinyl and a double LP, business. double LP, double LP. But yes. the way you designed it, you With know, I heard eight fold. You can see the pictures inside, oh, just like awesome. old days. Well, you and you designed it really, Ingvay. And I want you to talk about this to listen to the album from the beginning to the end, not just singular songs, but you want the listeners and your fans to listen to the whole body of work. I think it's important because the so I had so much time in here, I probably had. 
80, 90, 100 ideas for songs. Mm-hmm. So this, on this computer, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. So out of them, I only took 10 out. So you can imagine that how much they mean to me, you know, like I had a really... So when you go to a movie or you read a book, you see it from the beginning to the end. Right. That's how I made this album. It's very much mm-hmm. an album album. When you hear the, the, the full album, you're going to be surprised because there's like ballad in there. Um, there's some really crazy instrumental stuff. There's a couple more vocal songs. Um, it's a little journey, you know? And I, and I put it together with tempo, key, and everything, so it's kind of like it flows. So, I, yes, I think it's more important uh, to hear the whole thing. And I, I remember when I was a kid, I would take a record home, whatever. You know, you put it on the big stereo system, and you, you, right. you, you open the thing, put a needle on, you listen and look at the pictures. I know it's old-fashioned, but I think it's a really cool thing. You know, I'm such a fan of it. And I think, uh, as you and I both know, too, Ingbe, it's really become back into vogue, uh, you know, with the kids even, to where album sales are up. And there's just something about holding the album cover in there and seeing the artwork and seeing, Absolutely. you know, the engineers, all the musicians, everything. It, it's a visual and an oral experience. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It was really missing, but... Uh, I did a couple of albums that were really only on, on um, digital, which is okay, you know, but it kind of loses that there's so certain magic there, you know? Right. Yeah, there's yeah. just something better about it, especially with this incredible artwork that your wife, uh, you know, April suggested. It's like, you know, be able to see that artwork and then hear the music. And once again, you know, listen to these tracks that I've been listening to of yours with the, uh, with the new album. They're just powerful music. And, and it makes you want to hear more and engage in it. And, you know, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's why I think the album's going to do so well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I want to make sure, too, for our viewers, Ingve, that they know where to go, you know, because uh, I'm sure you're going to do autographed copies of, uh, of the final when it comes out and everything else. Uh, the full release of the album is July 23rd. You're going to have tours coming up, merch, you name it, for Parabellum. Where do our viewers need to go? ingvemalenstein.com and that's everything for the social media and all oh no there's facebook and there is uh instagram and there's all of those things yes of course and we're gonna have more more singles and more videos coming out too because you've got the lyric video i think it's one more single before the album drops and i believe it's the title track (laughs) and it's completely insane awesome it's completely insane. It's really way out there as far as the arpeggios and stuff like this. So I think that's the third one. I'm not sure. We have to check with the label. But uh, And then, of course, 2030 is the actual album. Yes. Amazing. Well, I'll tell you what, Ingve Malmsteen, thank you so much for coming on The Rocket Review. Congratulations on your brand new album, Parabellum. And we can't wait to see you on tour this year, too. Thank you very much, Saint. I, I'm very much looking forward to it. Sponsored by The Big 98, Nashville's number one for new country and the home of a Bobby Bones show. 